folic acid deficiency, megaloblastic anemia. Folic acid, which functions as a coenzyme in the synthesis of DNA, is essential for cell duplication and fetal placental growth. It also is an essential nutrient for the formation of RBCs. Maternal effects. Maternal needs for folic acid double during pregnancy in response to the demand for greater production of erythrocytes in fetal and placental growth. A deficiency in folic acid results in a reduction in the rate of DNA synthesis and mitotic activity of individual cells, resulting in the presence of large immature erythrocytes, megaloblasts. Folate deficiency is the primary cause of megaloblastic anemia during pregnancy. Non-food factors that contribute to folic acid deficiency include hemolytic anemias with increased RBC turnover, multifetal pregnancies, some medications such as anticonvulsants, and malabsorption entities. Folic acid deficiency often is present in association with iron deficiency anemia. Folate deficiency is associated with increased risk for spontaneous abortion, placental abruption, and fetal anomalies. A known association exists between folic acid deficiency and an increase in NTDs. Therapeutic management. The recommended daily allowance for folic acid doubles during pregnancy, and some women have difficulty ingesting the amount needed, even though it does occur widely in foods. The best sources of folic acid are fortified grains, beans such as black beans and lentils, peanuts, and fresh, dark green leafy vegetables. Folic acid often is destroyed in cooking. As a result of the awareness of the association between folic acid deficiency and NTDs, it is now recommended that all women of childbearing age take 400 micrograms, 0.4 milligrams, of folic acid daily to reduce the risk. This supplementation should be increased to 600 micrograms, 0.6 milligrams, when pregnancy is confirmed. Women who have had a previous child with an NTD should take 4 milligrams of folic acid for one month before and during the first trimester of pregnancy. Most prenatal vitamins contain 1 milligram of folate to ensure sufficient intake. Higher doses of folate may be prescribed according to individual needs. Sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is an autosomal recessive genetic disorder. It occurs when the gene for the production of hemoglobin S is inherited from both parents. The defect in the hemoglobin causes erythrocytes to become shaped like a sickle or crescent under certain conditions. Low oxygen concentration usually causes the sickling, with acidosis and dehydration worsening the process. At first, the erythrocytes regain their normal shape, but eventually they remain permanently sickled. Because of their distorted shape, the erythrocytes cannot pass through small arteries and capillaries and tend to clump together and occlude the blood vessel. The disease is characterized by chronic anemia because of the short lifespan of erythrocytes affected with hemoglobin S, increased susceptibility to infection, and periodic episodes of obstruction of blood vessels by the abnormally shaped erythrocytes. Sickle cell disease occurs most often in people who have ancestors from Sub-Saharan Africa, Spanish-speaking countries in the Western Hemisphere, South America, Caribbean, Central America, Saudi Arabia, India, and Mediterranean countries. In the United States, approximately 1 in 500 births in the black or African-American population and 1 in 36,000 births in the Hispanic population will result in an infant with sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia affects 90,000 to 100,000 people in the United States. Of blacks or African-Americans, 1 in 12 are carriers of the sickle cell trait and may pass the gene on to their children, even though they are not affected. Maternal effects. Physiologic anemia, increased coagulation factors, and venous stasis, which are normal in pregnancy, may bring on sickle cell crisis, sometimes for the first time. This broad term includes several different conditions, particularly temporary cessation of bone marrow function, hemolytic crisis with massive erythrocyte destruction resulting in jaundice, and severe pain caused by infarctions located in the joints and the major organs. In addition, Expectant mothers with sickle cell anemia are prone to pyelonephritis, bone infection, and heart disease. Preeclampsia occurs in approximately 14% of these women. 
preterm birth in IUGR are common. Mothers with higher hemoglobin F, fetal hemoglobin, levels may have a lower pre perinatal mortality rate, but fetal safety has not been established for hydroxyurea that increases its production. Fetal and neonatal effects. In the absence of maternal sickle cell crisis, the fetus usually fares well, although complications such as prematurity and IUGR are more common. The incidence of fetal loss is high if sickle cell crisis occurs because of placental infarctions with loss of exchange surface on the placenta. Therapeutic management. Women with sickle cell disease should seek preconception care or early prenatal care and be informed of the maternal and fetal risks associated with the pregnancy. Folic acid supplementation of 4 milligrams, 400 micrograms daily is prescribed. So that looks like a typo here on page 252. It says 4 milligrams and then it says 400 micrograms in parentheses. So 4 milligrams is actually equivalent to 4,000 micrograms. And according to my Googling, that I think they did mean they want 4 milligrams or 4,000 micrograms for the pregnant woman with sickle cell. So picking back up, ideally before conception, because of frequent erythrocyte turnover. Frequent measurements of hemoglobin, complete blood cell count, serum iron, total iron binding capacity, and serum folate are necessary to determine the degree of anemia and iron and folic acid stores. Testing is performed for infections such as hepatitis, HIV, tuberculosis, and STDs. Hep B and varicella vaccines may be given to the non-infected woman who is not immune to these infections. Urinalysis with culture and sensitivity, if indicated, identifies both clinical and subclinical UTIs that should be treated. Fetal surveillance studies, ultrasound, NSTs, and BPPs, assess fetal growth and development and placental function. Exchange transfusions or prophylactic transfusions may be used to increase the amount of normal hemoglobin in the mother's circulation and reduce severe anemia. Risks for prophylactic transfusions are comparable with risks in the woman without sickle cell disease. The woman with sickle cell disease may have a transfusion reaction and is likely to develop higher levels of antibodies to the cells in the transfused blood. Finding compatible blood for later transfusion might be more difficult. Prenatal supplementation of vitamins without iron may be prescribed for the woman who receives multiple transfusions, but for whom additional folic acid is indicated. The goal of nursing management is to help the pregnant woman with sickle cell disease maintain a healthy state and avoid hospitalization. Women should be encouraged to keep all prenatal care appointments, usually every other week and more frequently, if needed. Topics in prenatal education include the need for 1. Adequate hydration to prevent sickling, 2. Adequate nutrition to meet metabolic needs, 3. Folic acid supplementation for erythrocyte production, 4. Rest periods throughout the day, 5. Good hygiene practices and avoidance of persons with infectious illnesses, and 6. Prompt treatment for fever or other signs of infection. Nurses should be alert for signs of a sickle cell crisis. The most common indications are pain in the abdomen, chest, vertebrae, joints, or extremities, pallor, and signs of cardiac failure. Nurses also should provide comfort measures such as repositioning and good skin care, assisting with ambulation and movement in bed, and assisting the woman to splint the abdomen with a pillow when she must cough or breathe deeply. Nurses should remember that pain is not always related to the sickling crisis, but could be related to a complication of pregnancy. Women with sickle cell disease also can have ectopic pregnancy, placental abruption, appendicitis, and other painful complications not related to their blood disorder. Intrapartum care focuses on preventing the development of sickle cell crisis. Oxygen is administered continuously and fluids should be administered to prevent dehydration because hypoxemia and dehydration, as well as exertion, infection, and acidosis, stimulate the sickling process. 
Prophylactic blood transfusions may be given in an attempt to reduce perinatal mortality. Thalassemia. Like sickle cell anemia, thalassemia is a genetic disorder that involves the abnormal synthesis of alpha or beta chains of hemoglobin. This abnormal synthesis leads to alterations in the RBC membrane and decreased lifespan of RBCs. Thalassemia is named and classified by the type of chain that is abnormal. Beta thalassemia is most frequently encountered in the United States, often in those of Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, and Asian descent. Beta thalassemia minor refers to the heterozygous form that results from the inheritance of one abnormal gene from either parent. Beta thalassemia major refers to inheritance of the gene from both parents, homozygous form. Females with beta thalassemia major, Cooley's anemia, usually die in young adulthood. Those females who survive are often sterile. Maternal effects. Women with beta thalassemia minor often are mildly anemic but otherwise healthy. Laboratory values normally associated with beta thalassemia minor indicate a mild, hypochromic, and microcytic anemia. Large amounts of iron usually are not given despite the anemia because persons with beta thalassemia absorb and store iron in their bodies excessively and must take a chelating agent to rid the excess. Chelation therapy to remove heavy metals, such as iron, is discontinued during pregnancy if possible because pregnancy safety has not been established. Fetal and neonatal effects. Whether the disorders are associated with increased fetal or neonatal morbidity remains unresolved because of the many variants of thalassemia. There appears to be no increase in the rate of prematurity, low birth weight infants, or abnormal size for gestation. Fetal anemia may be serious if inadequate fetal hemoglobin is produced. The fetus may inherit the serious problem of beta thalassemia major if both parents have beta thalassemia minor. Therapeutic management. No specific therapy for beta thalassemia minor during pregnancy exists. Generally, the outcomes for the mother and the fetus are satisfactory. Infections that depress the production of RBCs and accelerate erythrocyte destruction should be identified and treated promptly. Other medical conditions. Women with pre-existing medical condition should be aware of the effects that pregnancy will have on their conditions as well as the impact of their medical conditions on pregnancy outcome. Some conditions that complicate pregnancy are discussed in this section. Others are described in Table 10.8. Immune complex diseases. Systemic lupus erythematosus. Systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE, is a chronic inflammatory autoimmune disease that can affect any organ or system in the body. The body attacks its own tissues as it would foreign antigens. Although the cause is unknown, an imbalance appears to exist between normal immune response to foreign antigens and an abnormal immune response of the body against its own cells. Signs and symptoms result from inflammation of multiple organ systems, especially the joints, skin, kidneys, and the CNS. The most common signs and symptoms of SLE are joint pain, photosensitivity, and a characteristic butterfly rash on the face, which may be less apparent during pregnancy because of the normal pigmentation changes. The disease is marked by episodes of exacerbation, flares, when the symptoms become worse, and quiescence when the symptoms recede. The disease tends to affect young women, but may occur in any age group. Females are affected 6 to 10 times more often compared with males. There is sometimes a family aggregation, but it is usually sporadic. It is more common in women of African, Hispanic, Asian, and Native American descent. Women with a history of renal problems should be advised to seek the advice of a physician before becoming pregnant. Pregnancy is most likely to have a favorable outcome in the woman whose disease is well controlled at the beginning and who does not have renal involvement. However, flares of SLE or disorders such as preeclampsia are more likely to occur during pregnancy and early postpartum. SLE is associated with increased incidences of spontaneous abortion and fetal death during the first trimester. 
after the first trimester, the prognosis for a live birth is higher if no active disease exists. Newborn risks include preterm birth, often resulting from preterm rupture of the membranes, and growth restriction. The most serious potential complication for the neonate is a congenital heart block, which usually is permanent and will require a pacemaker. Antiphospholipid syndrome. APS is an autoimmune condition characterized by the production of antiphospholipid antibodies combined with certain clinical features. Specific clinical features include thrombosis confirmed by imaging or pathologic studies, abnormal and recurrent pregnancy outcomes, an elevated anti-cardiolipin antibody or presence of lupus anticoagulant. Pregnancy problems may include the following, one or more unexplained fetal deaths at or after 10 weeks of gestation, one or more preterm births of a normal infant at or before 34 weeks of gestation that is related to severe preeclampsia or severe placental insufficiency, three or more unexplained recurrent spontaneous abortions before 10 weeks of gestation. Although the syndrome occurs most often in women with other underlying autoimmune diseases such as SLE, was diagnosed in women with no other recognizable autoimmune disease. Women with APS should be informed about potential maternal and obstetric problems, including a possible risk for stroke. They should be assessed for evidence of anemia, thrombocytopenia, and underlying renal disease. Some physicians believe that treatment with heparin may be warranted on the basis of increased risk for thrombosis, even in women with no previous clotting problems. Combinations of low-dose aspirin and prophylactic heparin, or enoxaparin, are recommended for pregnant women with APS. Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Characterized by antithyroid antibodies, causes most cases of hypothyroidism in women. Hypothyroidism in pregnancy increases risk for miscarriage, preterm birth, and preeclampsia. Maternal hypothyroidism during pregnancy can adversely affect the child's mental development. Thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH level, should be tested before or in early pregnancy and hypothyroidism corrected with levothyroxine. Rheumatoid arthritis. RA is a chronic inflammatory disease that usually affects the synovial hinged joints. Although the cause is unknown, an autoimmune mechanism is suspected. Marked improvement in symptoms of RA often occurs during pregnancy. The exact reason is unclear, but improvement is reported to parallel the rise in pregnancy-specific protein, which suppresses inflammatory reactions. Hormonal factors also have been suggested. For instance, increased levels of cortisol, estrogen, and progesterone may be beneficial in suppressing the immune response. Rheumatoid joints may become unstable in late pregnancy, with the natural joint relaxation and changes in weight distribution. Unfortunately, a relapse, postpartum flare, occurs within th 36 months after birth. In contrast to SLE, the risk for abortion does not increase markedly in women with RA. Usually, obstetric problems do not occur at delivery unless the hips or cervical spine are significantly deteriorated. Neurologic disorders, seizure disorders. Seizures are the most common form of epilepsy, which is a recurrent disorder of cerebral function. Epilepsy occurs in about 1.8% of the general population. Seizure control is the goal of treatment. The effect of pregnancy on the course of epilepsy is variable and unpredictable. The frequency of seizures may increase, decrease, or remain the same. In general, the longer the woman has been seizure-free before pregnancy, the less likely is the occurrence of seizures during pregnancy. Those with partial focal seizures are more likely to experience increased frequency. Vomiting, reduced gastric motility, use of GI medications, and weight gain affect the absorption and distribution of anticonvulsant drugs. Serum levels of anticonvulsants may rise, fall, or remain the same during pregnancy. Women with epilepsy have a higher than normal incidence of stillbirth and some studies have shown a higher incidence of preterm labor. Maternal bleeding may occur 
because of a deficiency of clotting factors associated with anticonvulsant drugs such as hydantoins, dilantin, and phenobarbital. Anticonvulsant drugs also compete with folate for absorption, which may result in folate deficiency. Most anticonvulsants are classified as pregnancy category C or D. Interactions between anticonvulsant drugs and other medications should be considered by the physician and pharmacist because dose changes or selection of valid alternative drugs may be needed. Effects of anticonvulsants and over-the-counter drugs should be considered as well. A major concern is the teratogenic effects of anticonvulsant drugs. The syndrome, known as fetal hydantuin syndrome, which includes craniofacial abnormalities, limb reduction defects, growth restriction, intellectual disability, and cardiac anomalies, has been described. Other anticonvulsants, such as trimethodion, paramethodion, and carbamazepine, also are associated with malformation syndromes. The teratogenic effects of phenobarbital are difficult to assess because it often is combined with other drugs. Newer anticonvulsants, such as levetiracetam, have fewer accumulated data related to fetal defects. Healthcare professionals should recommend that the woman consult a neurologist before conception. The goal of treatment is to prevent generalized, formerly called grand mal, seizures, and also reduce the adverse effects of anticonvulsant medications on the fetus. The family should be made aware of the risks involved when anticonvulsant drugs must be used. The woman and her family also should realize that treatment cannot be stopped during pregnancy unless the woman has been seizure-free for a prolonged time and stopped only at the directive of her physicians. Generalized seizures result in fetal hypoxia and acidosis and therefore pose a serious problem for the fetus. Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy is a sudden unilateral neuropathy of the seventh cranial facial nerve that causes facial paralysis with weakness of the forehead and lower face. No cause for the neuropathy is often identified although inflammation or viral infection of the facial nerve are possible causes. It is three times more common during pregnancy and generally occurs in the third trimester. Although the reason for the increase during pregnancy is unknown, one theory suggests that estrogen-induced edema causes pressure on the facial nerve, making the pregnant woman more vulnerable to the condition. The effect of pregnancy on the prognosis for Bell's palsy is unclear. The face feels stiff and pulled to one side. Closing the eye on the affected side may be difficult or impossible. Difficulty with eating or fine facial movements may occur. The ability to taste also may be disturbed. Treatment is controversial. Some physicians prescribe steroids within the first few days. Supportive care includes applying a patch over the eye and applying ointment or eye drops to prevent dryness or injury to the exposed cornea. Facial massage may be helpful, and the woman should be cautioned to chew carefully because she could easily bite the inside of her mouth or her tongue. Psychological support is necessary to assist the woman and her family to deal with the anxiety they naturally feel when sudden paralysis of the face occurs. They should be reassured that the condition is temporary in the majority of women who have Bell's palsy. Infections during pregnancy some infections acquired during pregnancy can adversely affect the health of the fetus, the mother, or both. Some infections are mild or even subclinical in the mother and yet may cause severe birth defects or death of the fetus. Other infections may have adverse effects by increasing the risk for other pregnancy complications such as preterm labor. Some infections are transmitted primarily or exclusively by sexual means, whereas others may be transmitted not only in the way in this way, but also by other avenues. The wide variety of infections affecting pregnancy care are divided into those caused by viruses and those caused by other organisms. Table 10.9 presents nursing considerations related to major STDs and vaginal infections. Table 10.9 also summarizes UTIs and their effects on pregnancy. Viral infections. 
Pregnancy does not worsen the effects of most viral infections. Although viral infections may be mild or even asymptomatic in mothers, fetal and neonatal consequences can be catastrophic. Maternal infections with cytomegalovirus, CMV, rubella, varicella zoster virus, herpes simplex, hep B, and HIV have the greatest potential for causing harm to the fetus or newborn. Cytomegalovirus. CMV, a member of the herpes virus group, is widespread and eventually infects most humans. CMV has been isolated from urine, saliva, blood, cervical mucus, semen, breast milk, and stool. Transmission may occur from contamination with any of these fluids, although close personal contact is required. CMV infection during pregnancy may be primary or recurrent. Symptoms of CMV infection are so vague that a woman is often unaware that she has an infection. Daycare centers are a common place for transmission of CMV among children, especially toddlers, because they often share objects contaminated with saliva. Mothers and caregivers of young children who attend a daycare center should be aware that a child might acquire an infection in the center and transmit it to those who are at risk for a primary infection. Puberty approaches, behaviors such as kissing, sexual intercourse, and other close bodily contacts again increase the possibility that CMV infection will be transmitted to a female who may be pregnant. After primary infection, the virus becomes latent. But like other herpes virus infections, periodic reactivation and shedding of the virus may occur. Primary infection is more likely to cross the placenta, infecting the fetus. It is a reactivation infection. Seroconversion, change in blood tests from negative to positive, in indicating development of antibodies, in response to infection or immunization, and a rise in the specific IgM antibody titer may not differentiate a primary and recurrent infection. Specific CMV IgG avidity testing may be useful for this purpose. Most infections are asymptomatic, so they may not be suspected during pregnancy, and testing may not be done. Diagnosis of neonatal infection is by urine culture. Fetal and neonatal effects. Approximately 5 to 10 percent of newborns infected with CMV show signs of congenital infection at birth, which may include intracranial calcifications, growth restriction, chorioretinitis, microcephaly, intellectual and physical disability, sensorineural deficits, hepatos plenomegaly, jaundice, hemolytic anemia, and thrombocytopenic purpura. It's a lot of words. Some infants who are asymptomatic at birth will develop late onset signs such as neurologic deficits, learning disabilities, chorioretinitis, psychomotor disabilities, and hearing loss. Therapeutic management. No effective therapy is currently available for the treatment of congenital CMV infection. Ultrasound scanning may identify manifestations of the infections, such as cranial abnormalities or growth restriction. Antiviral agents, such as gansiclovir and fosconet, may be used for severe infections, but these drugs are toxic and only temporarily suppress the shedding of the virus. Primary prevention by emphasizing good hygiene and hand washing, especially to women who care for small children, is the best way to prevent congenital CMV infections. Rubella. Rubella is caused by a virus transmitted from person to person through droplets or through direct contact with articles contaminated by nasopharyngeal secretions. Rubella infection after birth is a mild disease but congenital rubella could have severe consequences for the newborn. Common rubella signs and symptoms include fever, general malaise, and a characteristic maculopapular rash that begins on the face and migrates over the body. Fewer than 10% of pregnant women are not immune because infection confers permanent immunity. The overall incidence of rubella has declined since the vaccine became available in 1969 although many young adults remain at risk. The decline in adult rubella has virtually eliminated congenital rubella. 
Most U.S. cases of congenital rubella occur in foreign-born mothers, although there have been periodic rubella outbreaks in the United States. Fetal and neonatal effects. Rubella virus from the mother can cross the placental barrier and infect a fetus at any time during pregnancy. The greatest risk to the fetus is during the first trimester when fetal organs are developing. If maternal infection occurs during this time, approximately one-third of these cases will result in spontaneous abortions. Surviving fetuses may be seriously compromised. Deafness, developmental delay, cataracts, cardiac defects, IUGR, and microcephaly are the most common fetal complications. In addition, infants born to mothers who had rubella during pregnancy shed the virus for many months and therefore pose a threat to other infants and susceptible adults who come in contact with them. As pregnancy progresses, the risk for congenital rubella decreases. Therapeutic management. Prevention is the only effective protection for the fetus. Women who are immune do not become infected, so determining the immune status of all women of childbearing age is critical. A rubella titer of 1 to 8 or greater provides evidence of immunity. Women who are not immune should be vaccinated before they become pregnant, and they should be advised not to become pregnant for 28 days after vaccination because of the possible risk to the fetus from the live virus vaccine although the actual risk appears to be low. Many non-immune women are vaccinated during the postpartum period, so they will be immune before becoming pregnant again. In most facilities, women of childbearing age must read and sign a document indicating they understand the risks to the fetus if they become pregnant within 28 days. Varicella zoster virus. Varicella infection, chickenpox, is caused by varicella zoster virus, VSV, a herpes virus transmitted by direct contact or through the respiratory tract. Over 90% of people will have varicella infection before reaching reproductive age. After the primary varicella infection, the virus can become latent in the nerve ganglia. If VZV is reactivated, herpes zoster, shingles, results. Maternal complications of acute varicella infection may include preterm labor, encephalitis, and varicella pneumonia, which is the most serious complication associated with VZV. Varicella immunization has resulted in a marked decrease in children's varicella well before they reach the reproductive age. Fetal and neonatal effects. Fetal and neonatal effects depend on the time of maternal infection. If the infection occurs during the first trimester, the fetus has a small risk for congenital varicella syndrome, 0.4%. The greatest risk for development of congenital varicella syndrome occurs during 13 to 20 weeks of gestation, 2% of births. Clinical findings include limb hypoplasia, cutaneous scars, chorioretinitis, cataracts, microcephaly, and IUGR. The infant who is infected during the perinatal period, five days before through two days after birth, will not have the benefit of maternal antibodies. Four days before birth is not sufficient time for the mother to develop antibodies to VZV and pass them to the fetus. Varicella infection occurring in the fetus or infant just before or after birth would not be inactivated by antibodies, which leaves the infant at risk for life-threatening neonatal varicella infection. Varicella zoster immune globulin, VZIG, is indicated for the infant infected perinatally. Infants born earlier than 28 weeks or who weigh 1,000 grams or less are given VZIG because maternal antibodies to VZV earlier in pregnancy have not yet crossed the placenta, reducing natural passive immunity. Therapeutic management. Immune testing may be recommended for pregnant women who are presumed to be susceptible. VZIG should be administered to women who have been exposed and whose fetuses are at high risk for congenital varicella syndrome, although this may not prevent primary infection. Women infected with varicella during pregnancy should be instructed to report pulmonary symptoms immediately. 
hospitalization, fetal surveillance, full respiratory support, and hemodynamic monitoring should be available for women diagnosed with varicella zoster pneumonia because it may become severe in a short time. Acyclovir is the primary drug used to treat varicella quickly. For infants born to mothers infected with varicella during the perinatal period, immunization with VZIG as soon as possible, but within 96 hours of birth, provides passive immunity against varicella. Women and infants with varicella are highly contagious and should be placed in airborne and contact isolation. Only staff members known to be immune to varicella should come in contact with these clients. Adult immunization with the live attenuated varicella vaccine, Varivax, is recommended for non-pregnant adults who have no evidence of having had varicella. A pregnant woman should not be immunized, but members of her household may be immunized because the vaccine is not transmissible from one person to another. A non-immune postpartum woman should receive the vaccine before discharge and her second dose four to eight weeks postpartum. She should be instructed to avoid pregnancy for one month after each of the two injections. Non-immune healthcare workers should be immunized. Herpes simplex virus. Genital herpes is one of the most common STDs in the herpes simplex virus HSV group. It may be caused by HSV type 1 or 2. Most infections of genital herpes are caused by type 2. Type 1, which is more common in the mouth and upper body, also may infect the genital area. HSV infection occurs as a result of direct contact of the skin or mucous membrane with an active lesion. Lesions form at the site of contact and begin as a painful group of papules that progress rapidly to become vesicles, shallow ulcers, pustules, and crusts. The infected person sheds the virus until the lesions are healed. The virus then migrates along the sensory nerves to reside in the sensory ganglion, and the disease enters a latent phase. It can be reactivated later as a recurrent infection. Many women infected with HSV do not have signs and symptoms of infection and thus may shed the virus unknowingly. Vertical transmission from mother to infant generally occurs in one of two ways. One, after rupture of membranes when the virus ascends from active lesions, or two, during birth when the fetus comes in contact with infectious genital secretions or whether the fetal skin or when the fetal skin is punctured, such as with a fetal scalp electrode. Diagnosis usually is based on clinical signs and symptoms. Definitive diagnosis requires culture of the virus from an active lesion and results may take as long as five days. Newer tests based on genetic analysis, polymerase chain reaction, PCR, are becoming common for detection of HSV and other infections. Fetal and neonatal effects. Complications of pregnancy from a recurrent infection are rare. However, if primary infection occurs during pregnancy, the rates of spontaneous abortions, IUGR, and preterm labor increase. Neonatal herpes infection is uncommon but potentially devastating. The neonate may have infection limited to skin lesions or systemic disseminated infection. Symptoms usually appear within the first week and the disease progresses rapidly. The likelihood of death or serious sequelae in infants who have systemic herpes infection is approximately 50%. The risk for neonatal infection is greatest if the mother has a primary, rather than recurrent, infection during the perinatal period. This is most likely because the amount of virus shed is higher during a primary infection than during subsequent ones. Therapeutic management. No known cure for herpes infection exists, although antiviral chemotherapy, a cyclovir, is prescribed to reduce symptoms and shorten the duration of the lesions. A cyclovir may be given during late pregnancy to a woman with a recurrent outbreak 
to reduce the possibility of having active lesions at the time of birth. For women with a history of genital herpes, vaginal birth is allowed if there are no genital lesions at the time of labor. Cesarean birth is recommended for women with active lesions in the genital area, whether recurrent or primary at the time of labor. Use of fetal scalp electrodes, which cause a break in the skin, is acceptable when clinically indicated if there are no active lesions in the mother. Expectant mothers need information about effective ways to deal with the emotional and physical effects of herpes. Many women are concerned about privacy and do not want family members to know why cesarean birth is necessary. These women should be assured that their wishes will be respected. Women may need an opportunity to discuss their feelings of shame, anger, or anxiety about the possible effects of the virus on their infant. After delivery, isolation of the mother from her infant is not necessary if direct contact with lesions is avoided and mothers use careful hand washing techniques. Mothers may breastfeed if there are no lesions on the breasts. The infant is observed for signs of infection, including temperature instability, lethargy, poor sucking reflex, jaundice, seizures, and herpetic lesions. A cyclovir therapy is prescribed for neonatal infection. Parvovirus B19. Erythemia infectiosum, also called fifth disease, caused by human parvovirus B19, is an acute communicable disease characterized by a highly distinctive rash. The rash starts on the face with a slap cheeks appearance followed by a generalized maculopapular rash. Other symptoms include fever, malaise, and joint pain. Erythema infectiosum is most contagious before the rash is evident. The infection is more common among children and often occurs in community epidemics. The prognosis is usually excellent. However, if the disease occurs in pregnancy, potential fetal and neonatal effects exist. Parvovirus titers can be done if exposure during pregnancy is suspected to determine whether the mother is immune. PCR analysis of viral DNA is more sensitive than maternal antibodies, however. Fetal and neonatal effects. When infection occurs during pregnancy, fetal death can result usually from failure of fetal RBC production, followed by severe fetal anemia, high drops, generalized edema, and heart failure. Level of maternal serum alpha fetoprotein is sometimes elevated when fetal high drops is present. Serial ultrasonography also can be performed to detect high drops. Intrauterine transfusion is an option to treat severe fetal anemia if it does not resolve spontaneously. The risk to the fetus is greatest when the mother is infected in the first 20 weeks of pregnancy. The affected infant is examined for any defect, and the child is assessed regularly for several years to identify delayed complications such as persistent infection because of low levels of viral replication. Therapeutic management. No specific treatment exists. Starch baths may help reduce pruritus, and analgesics may be necessary to relieve mild joint pain. Hepatitis B. Multiple serotypes of hepatitis are recognized, but three are common in the United States, A, B, and C. Other serotypes, such as D, E, and G, require the presence of other hepatitis viruses to exist. Hepatitis A is transmitted primarily by fecal-oral contamination and can be limited by simple hygiene. Hepatitis A is rarely transmitted perinatally and supportive care is usually sufficient. Hepatitis B is transmitted via blood, saliva, vaginal secretions, semen, or breast milk and readily crosses the placenta. 
Mortality associated with acute hepatitis B is about 1%, but about 85 to 90% of adults recover. Chronic hepatitis B develops in 10% of infected adults who can continue to transmit the disease to others. Persons with chronic hepatitis B are also at greater risk for chronic liver disease, cirrhosis of the liver, and primary hepatocellular carcinoma. Hepatitis B is preventable with a vaccine, which is safe during pregnancy. Newborn vaccination against hepatitis B starts before discharge, with the second dose given one to two months later and the third dose given at six to 18 months. The incidence of hepatitis B virus, HBV, has fallen significantly with screening and immunization of at-risk people, including healthcare providers. Goals to eliminate HBV in the United States include the following, universal newborn vaccination, routine screening of all pregnant women and provision of immunoprophylaxis to infants born to infected mothers or women with unknown infection status, routine vaccination to unvaccinated children and adolescents. Vaccination of adults at increased risk for infection, including healthcare workers, those with STDs, household contacts or sexual partners of those having chronic HBV infection, multiple sex partners, recipients of certain blood products, and dialysis patients. Hepatitis C is acquired through blood products. Those at higher risk include IV drug users, those with recurrent STDs, including HIV, and persons needing recurrent blood products, such as hemophiliacs. Hepatitis C may remain undiagnosed until the woman develops chronic liver disease that often requires liver transplantation. The incidence of hepatitis C in pregnant women of childbearing age is approximately 1%. Fetal and neonatal effects. The risk for prematurity, low birth weight, and neonatal death increases when the mother has HBV infection during pregnancy. Infection of the newborn, whose mother is known to be HBSAG positive, usually can be prevented by administration of hepatitis B immune globulin, HBIG, Hep B, Gamma G followed by a hepatitis B vaccine, Recombivax HB, Engerix B, within 12 hours of birth. The newborn should be carefully bathed before any injections are given to prevent infections from skin surface contamination by the virus. The infant's vaccination should be repeated at 1 to 2 months and 6 to 18 months. Breastfeeding is considered safe as long as the newborn has received HBIG and the hepatitis B vaccine. Therapeutic management. Hepatitis B is a preventable infection. Simple hygiene measures such as safe sex and the use of standard precautions with body fluids provide primary prevention. Hepatitis B vaccines are available as a series of three intramuscular injections into the deltoid for adults with the second and third doses given one and six months after the first. Vaccination is recommended for any population at risk, including nurses and other healthcare workers who frequently come in contact with body fluids. All pregnant women should be screened for HBSAG. Women at high risk for hepatitis should be re-screened in the third trimester if the initial screen is negative. Household members and sexual contacts should be tested and offered vaccination if they are not immune. No specific treatment exists for acute HBV infection. Recommended supportive treatment includes bed rest and a high protein, low fat diet. Human immunodeficiency virus. AIDS is a failure in immune function caused by the retrovirus HIV. 
the infected person develops opportunistic infections or malignancies that ultimately are fatal. Transmission of HIV infection is predominantly through three modes. One, sexual exposure to genital secretions of an infected person. Two, parenteral exposure to infected blood or tissue. And three, perinatal exposure of an infant to infected maternal secretions through birth, vertical transmission. The continuing occurrence of HIV infections of infants demonstrates the importance of identifying and treating maternal infections during pregnancy to reduce the risk for infant infections. Breastfeeding is contraindicated for HIV positive women. After rapid increase in the number of cases of HIV infections during the early years of the epidemic in the United States, deaths from AIDS have declined with improved antiretroviral therapies. New cases of HIV in heterosexual women in the United States in 2015 were estimated to be 4,524 among black women, 1,131 among Hispanic women, and 1,431 among white women. Pathophysiology. Like other retroviruses, HIV integrates its viral genetic makeup into the genetic makeup of the cell when infecting it. This results in an abnormal cell that cannot perform its functions properly. At the same time, this cell replicates and produces more viruses that invade more cells. The disease worsens as more cells cease to function, and a greater number of viruses are produced. The principal mechanism by which HIV leads to immunodeficiency is through its destructive effect on cells that provide and regulate immunity. CD4 T lymphocytes, or helper T cells, play a key role in organizing the body's immune response to help immune functions. CD8 lymphocytes are T suppressor cells that limit excessive immune responses that might attack the person's own body tissues. When HIV infection invades body cells, the ratio of CD4 T lymphocytes to CD8 lymphocytes decreases. As the number of CD4 T lymphocytes declines, the immune response declines, and opportunistic infections can overwhelm the HIV-positive person. A CD4 T lymphocyte total count of less than 200 cells per millimeters cubed, or the development of opportunistic infections confirms the diagnosis of progression to AIDS. The clinical course of HIV infection follows fairly predictable stages. An early or acute stage occurs several weeks after HIV exposure, stage one. Flu-like symptoms may develop and last a few weeks. A middle or asymptomatic period of minor or no clinical problems follows stage two. This period is characterized by continuous low-level viral replication and CD4 cell loss. A late period of AIDS follows, which consists of opportunistic infections lasting months or years, stage three. During stages one and two, the infected person is said to be HIV positive. During stage three, the immune system no longer offers adequate protection and opportunistic diseases occur. The person is then said to have AIDS, regardless of the CD4 counts. Fetal and neonatal effects. Antiretroviral drugs have improved the prognosis for HIV infected women and their infants. Mothers who receive no or minimal HIV care during the prenatal period may have higher rates of infected infants. Infant infection may occur during pregnancy, during labor and birth, or after birth, if the infant is breastfed. Infant tests to diagnose HIV may include PCR for viral DNA and viral culture in addition to standard antibody tests. However, infant HIV tests can remain positive for up to 18 months after birth 
because of passive maternal antibodies. An infected newborn is typically asymptomatic at birth, but signs and symptoms may become obvious during the first year of life. Early signs may include enlargement of the liver and spleen, limp adenopathy, failure to thrive, persistent thrush, and chronic or recurrent diarrhea. Infected infants often have bacterial infections, such as meningitis, pneumonia, osteomyelitis, and septic arthritis. Prompt treatment of the HIV-infected infant with appropriate antiretroviral medications and other prophylactic therapy may slow the infection's progress. Prevention. Prevention remains the only way to control HIV infection. Sexual transmission can be avoided by several methods. Abstinence would render a person safe from all STDs, including HIV. However, for many people, sexual expression adds to their quality of life and many are not willing to practice abstinence. Transmission of HIV also can be prevented if infected persons do not have vaginal intercourse with susceptible persons. If intercourse does occur, barrier methods such as latex condoms reduce contact with infectious secretions. A condom also offers protection for transmission through oral sex. Intravenous drug users who refuse rehabilitative treatment should be taught to wash the equipment with water, soap, and bleach before each use to reduce transmission of the virus through a soiled needle. Therapeutic management. Multiple antiretroviral drugs from different classes are beneficial in extending life after infection and reducing the transmission rate to the infant. Guidelines for the latest treatments from the National Institutes of Health for pregnant as well as non-pregnant patients may be found at www.aidsinfo.nih.gov guidelines. Maternal Zeduvidine ZDV therapy to reduce infant HIV infection should consider many situations such as the following. Whether the mother has had any antiretroviral therapy during pregnancy, including ZDV, and when it began. Whether the mother had any prenatal care and when she started. Fetal gestational age. If the membranes have ruptured, how long have they been ruptured? Nursing considerations. Learning of HIV infection during pregnancy can have a devastating and immobilizing effect on the entire family. A nurse should be careful not to allow personal attitudes to influence professional behavior or the care of the woman and family during pregnancy, birth, and the postpartum period. Care of the woman with HIV during pregnancy can present many challenges to the nurse. Issues that arise during the postpartum period may include the following. Whether to continue or stop antiretroviral therapy. Support services needed after discharge. Contraceptive counseling, including the information that condoms can reduce the risk for acquiring or transmitting STDs and HIV transmission, but have a low rate of effectiveness for contraception. So I've read that about five times now, and I have no idea how that can be right, because I've always been told that condoms are 98% effective as a contraceptive. But I guess, uh, yeah, we're just going to roll with that. Uh, comprehensive follow-up for infection indicators and associated medical conditions counseling for a new diagnosis, and evaluation of the need for continued antiretroviral therapy. A patient problem of emotional distress due to multiple losses that include the mother's shortened life expectancy and possible death of the infant should be considered. Initially, crisis intervention may be necessary to help the family cope.
Nurses frequently must determine what the family perceives as the most pressing need and worries. The most common fears are loss of control, loss of support and love, social isolation, and loss of privacy. The nurse's response may involve finding ways for the woman to retain control while she is physically able and assisting her to select those in her family who will provide continued love and emotional support. Reassuring the woman that her right to privacy will not be violated is necessary. Nurses should help the woman maintain the highest possible level of wellness. Adequate, high-quality nutrition decreases the risk for opportunistic infections and promotes vitality. A daily regimen should include sufficient rest and activity, avoiding large crowds, travel to areas with poor sanitation, and exposure to infected individuals is important. Meticulous skin care is essential. The nurse should also provide information on routine ongoing health care for women. Examples are cervical cancer screening, adult immunizations, and mental health or substance abuse treatment. Instruction in signs and symptoms of postpartum depression and providing sources of assistance should be offered before discharge, just as for any woman in the postpartum period. The mother almost certainly will experience a great deal of anxiety about whether her infant will be HIV positive. Nurses need to respond honestly that testing will be required, but that most infants do not contract the virus if the medication regimen is followed carefully. In addition, nurses should reinforce information about medications that slow the progression of the disease in the mother as well as decrease the incidence of vertical transmission to the infant. Nonviral infections, toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is a protozoan infection caused by Toxoplasma gondii. Infection is transmitted through organisms in raw and undercooked meat, through contact with infected cat feces or soil, and across a placental barrier to the fetus if the expectant mother acquires the infection during pregnancy. Toxoplasmosis is more common in Europe because of greater consumption of meats that are rare or undercooked. Poor hand washing and sanitation of surfaces after food preparation increases the risk for toxoplasmosis in any country. Toxoplasmosis often is subclinical. The woman may experience a few days of fatigue, muscle pains, and swollen glands, but she may be unaware of the disease. If the infection is suspected, Diagnosis can be confirmed by positive results of serologic tests, which include indirect fluorescent antibody tests for IgG and IgM. Immune-compromised persons, such as patients who receive transplants or those infected with HIV, are more likely to have severe toxoplasmosis infection. Fetal and neonatal effects. Although toxoplasmosis may remain unnoticed in the pregnant woman, it may cause abortion or result in the birth of an infant with the disease. Approximately 40% of infants born to mothers who had an acute primary infection during pregnancy have congenital toxoplasmosis. About 50% of affected infants may be asymptomatic at birth, but others have serious effects such as low birth weight, enlarged liver and spleen, jaundice, and anemia, or coagulation disorders. Severe complications may develop several years after birth. Symptoms of congenital toxoplasmosis include chorioretinitis that may lead to blindness, seizures, hepatosplenomegaly, and mental retardation. Therapeutic management. All pregnant women should be advised to do the following. Cook meat, particularly pork, beef, and lamb, thoroughly until the juices run clear. Avoid touching the mucous membranes of your mouth and eyes while handling raw meat. Wash all surfaces that come in contact with uncooked meat. Wash your hands thoroughly after handling raw meat. Avoid uncooked eggs and unpasteurized milk. Wash fruits and vegetables before consumption. Avoid contact with materials that are possibly contaminated with cat feces, such as cat litter boxes, sandboxes, garden soil. Maternal treatment of toxoplasmosis during pregnancy is essential to reduce the risk for congenital infection. 
mines can be used alone but are less effective than combination therapy. Furamycin is successfully used in Europe for maternal toxoplasmosis and may be used according to specific guidelines within the United States. Group B Streptococcus Infection Group B Streptococcus GBS is a leading cause of life-threatening perinatal infections in the United States. The gram-positive bacterium colonizes the rectum, vagina, cervix, and urethra of pregnant as well as non-pregnant women. Approximately 20% to 25% of pregnant women are colonized by GBS in the vaginal or rectal area, but isolating the organism is often possible only intermittently. Often these women are asymptomatic, although symptomatic maternal infections can occur. These infections include UTIs, intrauterine infections, and metritis. Most women respond quickly to antimicrobial therapy. Fetal and neonatal effects. Early onset newborn GBS disease occurs within the first week after birth, often within 48 hours. Women who have GBS in the rectovaginal area at the time of birth have a 60% chance of transmitting the organism to the newborn, and about 1-2% to of these infants will develop early onset GBS disease. Sepsis, pneumonia, and meningitis are the primary infections in early onset GBS disease. Late onset GBS disease occurs after the first week of life, and meningitis, pneumonia, and bacteremia are the most common clinical manifestations. Therapeutic management. Healthcare providers have difficulty identifying pregnant women who are asymptomatic GBS carriers because the duration of carrier status is unpredictable. Optimal identification of the GBS carrier status is obtained by vaginal and rectal culture between 35 and 37 weeks of gestation. Women who have had a previous infant with GBS or a GBS in their urine in any trimester will be considered GBS positive at delivery. A woman who delivers at or before 37 weeks has ruptured membranes for 18 hours or more or has a temperature of 100.4 Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius or higher is also considered positive for GBS and should receive antibiotic therapy. Cesarean birth before membrane rupture does not require GBS antibiotic therapy. Penicillin is the first-line agent for antibiotic treatment of the infected woman during birth. Cefazolin is the alternative for the patient with non-life-threatening penicillin al allergy. Clindamycin is used for the woman at high risk for anaphylaxis. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, TB, results from infection with mycobacterium tuberculosis. It is transmitted by aerosolized droplets of liquid containing the bacterium, which are inhaled by a non-infected individual and taken into the lung. Initially, most individuals are asymptomatic. Women at risk should be screened for TB while obtaining prenatal care if they are not already known to be positive. The screening involves an intradermal injection of mycobacterial protein, purified protein derivative PPD. If the reaction is positive or the woman is already known to have a positive reaction, her abdomen should be protected by a lead shield while a chest radiograph is taken, preferably after the first trimester. Diagnosis is confirmed by isolating and identifying the bacterium in the sputum. Signs and symptoms include general malaise, fatigue, loss of appetite, weight loss, and fever. Symptoms occur in the late afternoon and evening and are accompanied by night sweats. As the disease progresses, a chronic cough develops and purulent sputum is produced. TB increases with poverty, malnutrition, and HIV infection. Worldwide, is it is responsible for more deaths than any other communicable disease. The incidence is increasing in inner city areas and among homeless persons. It is also prevalent among immigrants from Southeast Asia and Central and South America. Fetal and neonatal effects. Although perinatal infection is uncommon, it may be acquired as a result of the fetus swallowing or aspirating infected amniotic fluid. Diagnosis is made by finding the bacilli in the gastric aspirate 
of the neonate or in placental tissue. Signs of congenital TB include failure to thrive, lethargy, respiratory distress, fever, and enlargement of the spleen, liver, and lymph nodes. If the mother remains untreated, the newborn is at high risk for acquiring TB by inhalation of infectious respiratory droplets from the mother. Therapeutic management. Untreated TB poses a greater hazard to the fetus than its treatment. Treatment of TB is based on two principles. First, more than one drug should be used to prevent the growth of resistant organisms. Second, treatment should continue for a prolonged period. The preferred treatment for pregnant women with active TB is Ithoniazid, I-N-H, Rifampin, R-I-F, and Ethambutol, E-M-B, daily for two months, followed by I-N-H and R-I-F daily or twice weekly for seven months, for nine months of total treatment duration. Pyridoxine, vitamin B6, should be given with Isoniazid to prevent fetal neurotoxicity and because pregnancy itself increases the demand for this vitamin. Drug resistance in the TB organism may require addition of other drugs, although the following drugs are not recommended in pregnancy, streptomycin, canamycin, capriamycin, ethionamide, cyclorazine, pura Zinamide, amicacin, and fluoroquinolones. Management of the infant born to a mother with TB involves preventing the disease and treating the infection early. If the mother's sputum is free of organisms, the infant does not need to be isolated from the mother. Breastfeeding is safe, and drugs may be secreted in breast milk. However, the maternal anti-tuberculosis drugs in breast milk are not adequate for infant treatment. Drug serum levels in the infant can be measured to identify if levels are too high. Disease prevention focuses on teaching the mother and the family how the disease is transmitted so that they can protect the infant and other family members from airborne organisms. The infant should be skin tested at birth and may be started on preventative isoniazid therapy immediately. Skin testing is repeated at three months. Isoniazid is usually continued for the infant until the mother's TB has been inactive for at least three months. Infant TB medication may be stopped if the mother and other family members have received full treatment and show no additional disease. If the skin test result shows conversion to positive, a full course of drug therapy should be given to the infant.